everybody, welcome back to the Royal Kingdom Estate Platform. My name is Ajwa Adi and I'm going to be your host for today. So I'm so elated to let you know that we're going to be introducing a brand new show on this channel called The Lawyer's Corner. And on this show, we're going to be talking everything legal. So as you know, we have a lot of diaspora clients and every day we get questions about citizenship, about land administration in Ghana. And we thought, okay, so to answer all your questions, we're going to be having this show where we invite legal professionals professionals in the space to come and speak on some of these issues. So for the very first episode, we have the head of legal for Royal Kingdom Estate, lawyer Kwabina Fio, to engage us. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Lawyer's Corner. Guys, help me welcome lawyer Kwabina Fio to the Royal Kingdom Estate platform. Hi, sir. Hi. How are Hi. you? Nice meeting you. Nice Fine. meeting you too. <laughs> so um, diving right into the conversation, because I know people are interested. They want to know, okay, what's going to happen today? Speaking of land administration, before we even come to it as a topic, first and foremost, what is land and what constitutes land in Ghana? Okay, so uh, I shall first of all start by saying that the definition of land is uh -huh. contained in section 281 of Act 1036. Okay. And you, you can also check the definition of customary land law in Olenu and Woodman's book, okay. which is a book well known mm. by practitioners of the law. Right. So those books uh, simply summarize land law to, land to mean the material land itself mm -hmm. and the things that are contained thereon. Okay. So basically. Wonderful. So and it includes rivers, trees, everything mm -hmm. that are contained on the land. Okay. And I mean the Latin maxim that says that. Quickly brought to solo, solo said it. That's whatever is contained on land forms part of the land. Okay. So land, burden, and everything that is contained on land forms part of the land. Okay. Basically. I see. Okay, then can you give us an overview of land administration in Ghana? Okay, so I think that we cannot discuss land, land administration in Ghana without putting with it within the historical context. Okay. If you recall, in 1897, a lot of political scientists and legal scholars will tell you those are the events that actually kick-started our independence struggle. Okay. In 1896, the British sought to, which is the colonial authority, sought to introduce a land bill. Mm -hmm. And this land bill, essentially, to summarize, was to suggest that there were ownerless lands in, in West Africa and the Gold Coast, particularly. Okay. And for them, any land that was not in use mm -hmm. You don't have ownership. Okay. It was ownerless. So there were people like John Mensa, Saba, Kisley mm -hmm. Hayford, mm -hmm. J.P. Brown, and others yeah. who stood up and fought against the British. Okay. The fundamental disagreement they had with the bill was that in Africa, and particularly within Gold Coast, land is not for the living, not just for the living, mm -hmm. but also the generations are born. Right. You come to appreciate this since if you look at the tenure of customary land law in Ghana. Yeah. You get to know that this concept, in fact, is what has straddled our, our political history and land administration history throughout the years. I see. So the resistance was said that, uh, in fact, the land uh, law, actually that particular land bill failed yeah. because, like I indicated earlier, land is not for the just for the living. It's also a generation and born. Exactly. So if you see a land that is lying fallow, it doesn't mean it has not it's got useless, owners. It's right. Yes, it has owners. There is pre preservation of those lands mm -hmm. for generations and born. Right. So, so basically, you know that historically, lands were owned by families, mm -hmm. and schools, and communities. Right. But in the introduction of colonialism, actually watered down a little bit of those particular customary history in relation to land. Mm. You know, in England, and, and, and the British were our colonial masters then, yeah. basically, and in England, land is vested in the crown, mm -hmm. which means that all lands are vested in the crown. It means that the monarchy owns right, the Right, they own yeah. everything. But in our, in our part of the world, land is not owned okay. by the state. Land okay. is owned by students' families. At that time or in present time? At that time, okay. you get to know with time as we proceed mm. that there has been certain elements of changes. Okay. But 
essentially lands are still owned by schools, mm -hmm. families, families and the state. Right. If you look at Article 20 of the Constitution, it empowers the state to acquire lands. Okay. What's the reason? There's the power we call the power of eminent domain. Mm -hmm. Because we are a state and the state will need land as a resource mm -hmm. for public good. Okay. To build hospitals, roads and all those things. So the state can acquire interest in land. And so the state has become a factor in terms of land ownership in Ghana. Okay. So going forward, I would say that if you look at the 60s, when we gained independence, there was a raft of le legislations. Mm -hmm. In fact, the Nkuma, if you look at land administration, Garen Nkuma was the foremost leader who introduced, introduced a lot of legislations that helped in our land administration. If you want me to make reference to it, I'll make reference to it. I'll show you the number of legislations that were passed okay. in the 60s. And that will tell you that uh, he actually did well for for the country. The country. Okay. Look at, for instance, one, Land Development and Protection of Purchases Act 1960, Act 2, mm -hmm. was passed in the 1960s. Okay. I mean, 1960. We also have Farm Lands Protection Act 1962, mm -hmm. Act 107. We had Land Registry Act 1962, Act 122, 1960. Okay. We also have Administration of Lands Act 19, uh, 1962, Act 123. Mm -hmm. We also have State Lands Act 1962, Act 125. We also have uh, the Survey Act 1962, Act 127. Okay. Uh, we also have Lands Miscellaneous Provisions Act 1963, Act 161. Okay. So you see that this raft of legislation mm -hmm. were the legislation that governed land administration in Ghana then. Mm. And progressively, we did not have any material reforms until in the mid 70s, where we, there was the Conveyancy Act. Okay. Act, uh, Conveyancy Act. Uh, in 1975, that is NRC Decree 175. Okay. So this law was this, essentially the law after the 60s that introduced uh, reforms in land administration, and this legislation was the basic law that determined ownership of land and various interests in land and how land is handled within the country. I see. Moving forward, we came to there were no material reforms until 1986 where Land Title, Admi uh, land title Registry uh, Act was introduced. That's Act, if you look at the law, uh, PNDC Law 152, 1986. Okay. And this law basically was the land that determined how land ownership is, I mean, land is acquired, okay. interest in land, and I mean, the administration of land generally. So, moving forward again, you we came to 2003 where there was a policy dialogue to introduce reforms uh, into land, our land administration that introduced the land administration uh, project okay. which has been ongoing we've had lap one and two i believe so okay. uh, but we have not been able to complete the project as a result of challenges that are there but i mean uh, the state is involved uh, continuously involving the reforms if you go to Lands Commission, you can see quite clearly that those some of those reforms have has led into a situation where all the units that were in the past were not speaking to each other have now been combined. Okay. So for instance, now if you please a search, there's a tripartite search. If you please mm -hmm. a search, we I will ask for one search, it will go to three units. Okay. Before your search will be answered. So and that unison. That, and that will give you a okay. comprehensive understanding of the state of the particular land you are researching or researching on as well as land administration is concerned. Okay. So then we come to the mother of all legislations. <laughs> that's Act 1036. Yeah. All these raft of legislation. Which was, that you, was introduced in 2020. It was introduced in 2020, okay. Act 1036. Okay. All these raft of legislation I told you about from 1960s mm -hmm. till 1987 and all those things have now been consolidated into one law. Okay, so you everything notice, has been fused together. Precisely, and it is one of the biggest 
um, advancements okay. in land administration in Ghana. So it has sought to address all the challenges and bottlenecks that is involved in administration of land in Ghana. That is not to suggest that we are out of the woods yet. Right. There are many other challenges that are there. But I think that in the implementation of the in the in the implementation of the law, mm -hmm. the challenges that comes out are dealt with by the courts and those forms part of our legal jurisprudence and basically that shapes our land administration in Ghana. Yeah. I see. Wow, we've traveled from the 60s all the way to the 2020s to recent times and you've given a thorough coverage of it all. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. What would you say is the role of government in land administration in Ghana? Basically, if you look at the constitution, the states, the territories of Ghana is supposed to be con uh, under the control of the government of the republic. Mm -hmm. I mean, so the state has interest in this territory and okay. the essence is not to seek or have any other country if it basically like I mean to attack and take part of our lands mm. even though those lands may belong to families and schools and mm. individuals yeah the state has the power and the duty to protect the territorial integrity of Ghana mm. and those territorial integrity include our land I see. So, and when it comes to land management and land administration, even though these are two concepts all together, two different concepts all together, the state is involved in the administration of land. So, Lands Commission is the principal institution that is mandated by law. Right. Look at the Lands Commission Act. It's mandated by law to to be involved in land administration in Ghana. Okay. So that's to the extent of the state being involved in land administration in Ghana. Right. You spoke about, you mentioned some of the bodies that own land in Ghana. I want us to run through it quickly. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the, uh, the, uh, the stool lands mm -hmm. or the family lands. We have the um, state's lands. Yeah. What other bodies are there and you see, what are their functions? Like I said, historically, lands were owned by stools, families, and stools, families, and the state came in. Mm -hmm. And land, the state acquires land through its eminent domain right. power. Beyond the stool, just just for people that don't know, what's what's that eminent domain power? Okay, so under Article Twenty of the Nineteen Ninety Two Constitution, like I indicated earlier, the state has the power to acquire land and also to pay compensation for those lands. Normally, the state will issue executive instruments mm -hmm. to acquire those lands so that the lands will be used for. The public good. So, for instance, where Kolibu is situated, mm -hmm. is the land is owned by not by the state initially. Right. The, state, the land was not initially owned by the state. The University of Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, all these public institutions that are on vast lands you see were lands acquired through executive instruments mm. issued by the state. So, for instance, Akka Training College, it was issued. Uh, there was an instrument in 1974, EI 72 of 1974, mm -hmm. that was used to acquire Accra Training College land. Okay. And it encompasses all those land around Mpen Wansem up to the Blue Trigans and all the UPSC mm -hmm. area and all those. Things. So the state uses the power of eminent domain to acquire it. The only requirement under law is that the state must pay uh, compensation to the owners of the okay. land. And this compensation ought to be based on market values that okay. the land have been sold for. Yes. So it doesn't directly take from the individuals, but there's a compensation factor as well. Normally, there's a procedure under the law. When the state wants to acquire the land, I'm sure the state will, by law, the state will contact the owners of the land, the family, and there will be discussion. The state will issue EIs, mm -hmm. which is the executive instrument to acquire the land. There has been a lot of problems in relation to these acquisitions. Right. In the past, the state will issue the EIS and acquire this land and compensation will not be paid. So right. you will find a lot of families across the country who will be agitated and always agitating for compensation to right. be paid. You will see that that's how come a lot of families will re-enter the land and they're selling the land and all those things. But the problem appears to have been solved. Okay. And the new Act, the Act 1036, that's the 
not now. I mean, uh, last Act 1036, yeah. 2020. It, there's a provision that says that for the state to issue e, an EI, that's an executive instrument to acquire lands, the state must ensure that the previous year it has budget, budgeted the sum for okay. the acquisition of the land before it can issue the EI system to, I mean, the EI to acquire right. the land. So basically, that's a, that's how it is now. Uh, land owners have been protected now by law so that if the state wants to acquire land, the state must ensure that it has resources before it goes into a, a land. land. So basically, the state has used this law that I spoke about, the eminent domain law, to acquire lands for our use. Okay. Other than that, how would hospitals be built? Right. Uh, on whose lands will hospitals be built? The investment you and I attended and all those other lands that are used for public good. Okay. How do we get them? So right. the state will use this to acquire it from families as tools for the public good, yes. Are there any instances where the individuals do not want to uh, give up the land to the state? And such in such instances, what happens? Oh, they see, the, the power to acquire land is a, con is a provision in the constitution that gives the state the authority to do so. Okay. Individuals have no option. Okay. The only requirement under law is for the state to demonstrate that it wants to use the land for the public good. Okay. So for, for instance, the state cannot acquire the land and thereafter share the land among themselves, I mean, among politicians. Right. So you notice that there was a, a Supreme Court decision around the Shiachin area where, you know, the airport city is. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people went to court and they said that the state acquired the land for public good. Right. And that once the state had no use for the land and they were using it for purposes other than what the what they lands started, were taking for, right. they were going to take back the lands. But the Supreme Court came out with a decision uh, that the running of hotels, banks, hospitals, and all those facilities that you see there are incidental to the running of a, a modern airport. Okay. And therefore, the families could not come for the lands. Oh. And so that resolved those matters. I yeah. see. I think I wanted to ask you, so out of all the bodies that you mentioned, which people own the majority percentage of land in Ghana? Okay, Is so it the state or the it family? Depends on the, it depends on the jurisdiction. Okay. So, if you go to the Volta region, for instance, mm -hmm. you find that majority of lands owned there are by families. Okay. If you come to Eastern region, a lot of lands are owned by the the family. Right. Some are own, own, also owned by the stool. Mm -hmm. If you go to Ashanti region, it's a whole ball of games all together. Right. There are those who will tell you that lands are owned by family, families. But as we all know, currently in Ashanti region, you cannot sell land without the consent and approval of the Ashanti. Right. So I will say that Ashanti, the interest of Ashanti in, in the lands in Ashanti it's like an Aludia one. Okay. This is all the time we have for today. Uh, we've spoken on land administration and the various bodies, you know, in place when it comes to owning land and their Alodia owners and everything that has to do with it. So on the second episode, we'll definitely be back with more. If there are particular subjects that you want um, Lawyer Kovna Field to touch on, if you have personal concerns and interests that you need answers to, please leave them. Engage us in the comment section and we will take notice of all of them and then try to answer as many as we can. So this is a wrap for the first episode. Subscribe to the channel, like, share the video, always turn on your post notification and we'll be back with more content.